Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless satan does nothing but mimic the one true god he has now stolen the four horsemen in the book of revelation that we refer to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse and calls them the four horsemen of the climate end game forget the apocalypse researchers say we may be looking for the wrong four horsemen Right now, I think we're being naive. We're not looking at the worst case scenarios at all, really. Dr. Luke Kemp and his team at the University of Cambridge are studying the effects of human-caused climate change. They are warning the public about what they call the four horsemen of the climate endgame. Famine, extreme weather, conflict, and diseases spread by insects. Dr. Kemp told CBS News, this research isn't to scare people but to encourage world leaders to take definitive action on climate change and to be prepared if we fail. The ultimate purpose of this area of study, it's not supposed to be any kind of disaster voyeurism. It's supposed to be about understanding to prevent the worst case. Extreme weather events and pollution have been acknowledged by politicians and world leaders as being a global crisis. Half of humanity is in the danger zone from floods, droughts, extreme storms and wildfires. No nation is immune. But researchers say at the current rate of emissions, in just 50 years, parts of the globe will see an annual average temperature of more than 84 degrees Fahrenheit, which just might bring the four horsemen of the climate endgame. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16, 21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. The effects of climate change can be seen all around, from raging wildfires to catastrophic flooding. So far, the conversation has primarily been how to prevent it from getting worse. Half of humanity is in the danger zone from floods, droughts, extreme storms, and wildfires. No nation is immune. But now a team of international experts led by Cambridge University says we should be prepared for failure. Right now, I think we're being naive. We're not looking at the worst case scenarios 
at all, really. Researchers warn about what they call the four horsemen of the climate endgame. Famine, extreme weather, conflict, and disease spread by insects. Scientists are urging world leaders to investigate possible outcomes ranging from a loss of 10% of the global population to eventual human extinction. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction, and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven-year tribulation, in which the inhabitants of planet Earth who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. It is time to run to Jesus. You more than likely will not survive the seven-year tribulation when Jesus returns, as the Antichrist will be looking to kill all Jews and Christians, and will require the inhabitants of the earth to take a mark signifying that they worship him as God. Without this mark, you will not be able to buy or sell. It would be so much easier to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, as Jesus provided an escape for his true followers, as we read in Luke 21:36. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. When is the rapture going to happen in relation to the tribulation? The timing of the rapture in relation to the tribulation is one of the most controversial issues in the church today. There are four views on the timing of the rapture. The pre-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs before the tribulation starts. The pre-wrath view, where the rapture happens before the great day of wrath in Revelation 6, 17. The mid-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs at or near the midpoint of the tribulation. And the post-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation. The primary scripture passage on the rapture is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. It states that all living believers, along with all believers who have died, will meet the Lord Jesus in the air and will be with him forever. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. A few verses later, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord, Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, which deals primarily with the time period of the tribulation, 
is a prophetic message of how God will pour out his wrath upon an unbelieving and unrepentant world. It seems inconsistent for God to promise believers that they will not suffer wrath and then leave them on the earth to suffer through his anger during the tribulation. Another passage on the timing of the rapture is in Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Christ promises to deliver believers from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole earth. This could mean two things. Either Christ will protect believers in the midst of the trials, or he will deliver believers out of the trials. It is important to recognize what believers are promised to be kept from. It is not just the trial, but the hour of trial. Christ is promising to keep believers from a specific time period that contains the trials, namely the tribulation. The purpose of the tribulation, the purpose of the rapture, the meaning of 1 Thessalonians 5.9, and the interpretation of Revelation 3.10 all give clear support to the pre-tribulation position. If the Bible is interpreted literally and consistently, the pre-tribulation position is the most biblically based interpretation. Another good reason for a pre-tribulation rapture is, the tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble as we read in Jeremiah 37. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The tribulation is primarily for the salvation of the Jewish nation of Israel, as God renames Jacob Israel, as we read in Genesis 32:28. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. After the rapture, the age of grace has ended, and God shifts his focus back to the Jews, as he promised to save a remnant of them, as we read in Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, This is my people, and each one will say, The Lord is my God. The coming seven-year tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation, in which the Jewish people will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They will receive Yeshua as their Messiah, and they will cry out, Baruch haba b'shem Adne, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Whatever we believe about the timing of the rapture, there are two realities all Christians must keep in mind. First, no difference of opinion among Christians justifies unkindness or hostility toward those who hold different views. Jesus commands us to love one another, just as he loved us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15, 12. Jesus also said that by our love for one another, all people would know that we are his disciples, as we read in John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Wrangling and name-calling over issues such as the timing of the rapture does not exhibit Christ's love. 1 Timothy 6, 3-5 If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Brothers and sisters, 
No matter what our view may be on the timing of the rapture, we must exhort one another as we see the day of the Lord approaching. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month, or he might come next week, or he could even come... Don't be left behind, accept Jesus today. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Breaking news overnight. China firing missiles near Taiwan. The exercises following Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip there. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, is tracking the latest. Hours after Nancy Pelosi left Taiwan, China has for the first time launched massive military drills using live fire all around the island. Chinese state media showed these pictures. They show Beijing launching their Dengfeng missiles directly into waters east, northeast and southwest of the island. Taiwanese military is saying China launched 11 ballistic missiles in just a two-hour period. Now, these are long-range weapons capable of traveling hundreds of miles, and it's thought these military drills are likely to last three days. Some flights are being canceled. Commercial shipping has had to be rerouted, and we're hearing reports of cyber attacks inside Taiwan as well. Now, a Chinese spokeswoman has said the drills were in response to what she called collusion between the United States and Taiwan. Now, this is a self-governing democracy, but China claims it as part of its own. And Nancy Pelosi was the most senior U.S. official to visit since the late 1990s. Now, all this is concerning because it shows just how quickly uh, China can launch these kinds of exercises. And it also demonstrates what China might do in the future if it were to launch military action by essentially causing a maritime blockade. A potential nuclear disaster in the making in Ukraine. The UN's nuclear chief is warning a nuclear plant, the largest in Europe, is, quote, completely out of control after Russian troops seized it. Our senior foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, is in Ukraine and has the latest. That's right. I mean, Ukraine is home to a number of key nuclear power plants. Of course, few of us can forget the fallout from that Chernobyl disaster. But at the start of the war, that was also occupied by the Russians. Today, it's been retaken, stabilized, and back under Ukrainian control. But today, it's this other huge nuclear facility here that's caught in the crossfire that's ringing alarm bells around the world. This morning, a nuclear crisis in Ukraine. The UN sounding the alarm about Europe's largest power plant caught in the middle of the war. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency warning the situation is extremely dangerous. The physical integrity of the place has not been respected. Zaporizhia is completely out of control. Located in the southeastern city of Vernehudar, was taken by force by Russian troops in early March, shortly after the invasion began seen here in video posted by the mayor of the city. But while Russian troops control the plant, Ukrainian staff still run it, contributing to mounting tensions and deteriorating operations. Ukraine accusing Russia of storing weapons, explosives and military hardware at the plant, using it as cover to shell a nearby town. Russia accusing Ukraine of attacking the plant too. Fighting is escalating nearby. In a video released by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, a drone strike in July targeting Russian troops just outside the plant. And the US now accusing Russia of using the nuclear plant as a human shield. Russia is now using the plant as a military base to fire at Ukrainians, knowing that they can't and won't shoot back because they might accidentally strike a nuclear uh, a reactor or highly uh, radioactive waste in storage. But the UN now issuing an urgent plea for Russia and Ukraine to try and allow international inspectors in to stabilize the site 
and of course avoid another nuclear disaster on Ukrainian soil. Now to the latest on the fallout from the U.S. drone strike that killed the leader of Al Qaeda. The U.S. has warned Americans around the world about potential retaliation. Our senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, has more on the Taliban's reaction. The Taliban this morning is weighing how to respond to this strike. You know, since assuming power last year, the government had been hoping for international recognition. But the knowledge now that al Zawahiri was hiding in plain sight and how the Taliban responds to this now is significantly complicating those aspirations. This morning, the Taliban reacting to the U.S. airstrike that killed al Qaeda leader Ayman al Zawahiri. Group representative says they are investigating what they call the U.S. claim of his death, saying the government and the leadership wasn't aware of what is being claimed, nor any trace there. Outside his home in Kabul, security tight. The balcony where he was killed covered with a tarp. Top leadership is said to be holding lengthy discussions about how to respond. Zawahiri stepped in as al-Qaeda's official leader after the death of founder Osama bin Laden in 2011. Now the next man in line is poised to take his place. The next al-Qaeda leader in line is a fellow by the name of Zayf al-Adl, and he's thought to be in Iran, which is really interesting because that presents uh, further complications in terms of uh, his allegiances, who he works for, why is he in Iran. With the movement's leadership in flux, experts say al-Qaeda is no longer what it once was. The real threat now comes from its splinter groups, newer terrorist organizations that were inspired by them or broke away in the last decade or so, including ISIS. The roads going in and out of Gaza, as well as most of those around the Strip, remaining closed on Wednesday for the second day in a row. This says defense officials are still concerned over the chance of an Islamic Jihad terror attack targeting Israeli civilians in the south. Some 100 IDF reservists now joining the ranks of active duty units taking posts near Gaza on Wednesday. This says the closures around the Strip remaining in force for the second day in a row following the arrest of Islamic Jihad's West Bank leader in Jenin. IDF forces disguised as Palestinians arrested the Islamic Jihad chief Bassem Saadi as well as his son-in-law in a raid on Monday night. Saudi has been wanted by Israel for actively building up the Islamic Jihad's power in Jenin and elsewhere around Judea and Samaria. Also, several deadly terror attacks in Israel this past year attributed to Islamic Jihad. And Saadi's son-in-law, while not targeted for arrest in the raid per se, considered a high-value target as well, as he is Saadi's close aide. In any case, as tensions running high following the arrest, Israel concerned that the terror group may launch reprisal attacks against Israeli civilian communities in the Gaza periphery. So the alert level in the area has been raised, and all civilian vehicles are asked to steer clear of the area for fear of sniper fire or anti-tank missiles. That said, Israel also putting pressures back onto the Islamic Jihad, as well as onto the Hamas terror group, which controls the Gaza Strip. IDF Chief of Staff Aviv Kochavi explaining that Israel's policy is clear. Israel will extend a hand to whoever wants to work and live alongside Israel, and Israel will smite whoever seeks to harm Israeli civilians and cause terror. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Here in France, a third heat wave is contributing to a nationwide drought which started in July. Authorities have restricted water use in nearly all regions in an effort to preserve crops. With temperatures soaring to 40 degrees Celsius, the episode's milder than the hot spell last month, although meteorologists say this is simply a sign of things to come. Let's take a listen. We are seeing record levels of drought. That's to say that we've never seen the ground as dry as it is at the moment. We're still expecting very anti-cyclonic weather throughout the country without rainfall. And so there's so far no end in sight to this drought. There have been other years, but these heat waves have been more and more numerous in recent years and are set to become more so in the years to come. All of this is linked to global warming. Canal locks no longer opened just for a single boat and barges having to limit their load to avoid touching the riverbed. This summer's extreme heat is being felt all across France. In the town of Girardbert in the east of the country, the underground water tables are empty, meaning that water is now being pumped from the lake. While authorities on the island of Corsica have warned that reserves will dry up by the end of the month if rules limiting water usage aren't obeyed. 
With only little rain over the past months, land is dry. We've never seen anything as bad as this. This isn't normal. And with up to 6,000 litres of water needed for his cattle every day, this farmer in the southwest has resorted to selling a dozen of his cows. It'll allow me to buy more food for them and avoid tapping into hay stocks for the winter. France last experienced a major heat wave in 2003, but this year's trend is set to continue over the coming years. Now we turn to the brutal weather plaguing much of the U.S. right now. Millions of Americans face extreme heat today, and it could be dangerous. I mean, we're talking about triple-digit temperatures in some areas. The heat is complicating search and rescue efforts in eastern Kentucky after the worst flooding in decades. Justin Michaels from the Weather Channel has the story. Extreme weather has America's infrastructure on the brink. With the eastern half of the U.S. facing intense heat and humidity today, power companies like New York's Con Edison are issuing warnings that a massive increase in demand could cause outages during an extremely dangerous time. We're concerned about the consecutive one day after the next of high temperature, high heat, and the high demand and the stress that that puts on the system. And in Texas, where unrelenting heat keeps pressure on the power grid, ERCOT, the state's energy supplier, expects today to set another new record for electricity demand for the 12th time in less than two months. Electricity prices in the Dallas area are expected to soar to as much as $400 per megawatt hour for this afternoon. Compare that to the average price over the last five years, $56. In Kentucky, the sweltering heat is only adding to the misery. Communities here are working to rebuild crucial parts of their infrastructure following last week's deadly flooding. I thought it was going to be months before I could even get out of here. The community of McRoberts crafted this makeshift bridge after the original was destroyed by rushing floodwaters. It's the only way in and out of town. Just down the road in the town of Neon, the daunting cleanup effort inches forward while residents try to pick up the pieces. If there's one thing that you could get back that you know you can't, but if you could, what would it be? My father's oil paintings. This is so sad. When we spoke with Tom King, his auto repair business had just been deemed unsafe. After sheer devastation, it's yet another setback. I've lost everything I had. My whole livelihood's gone. It's hard to imagine one week ago this morning, floodwaters were ravaging this small town, Neon, Kentucky. In fact, a week ago right now, I would be standing in 10 feet of floodwaters. Sajid Ali wades through the waters of his flooded cotton field after days of monsoon rains. He says his crop was worth around $7,500, and now he has to find another way to earn an income. We'd been working so hard on this crop for months. I'd taken out a loan to plant it, but now I have to go and work on someone else's land because we can't make ends meet. The damage is clear from above, with homes swept away and survivors living in tents. Around 60 families call this little town in southern Pakistan home, raising crops of cotton, chilies and wheat. But now their livelihoods are in ruin. Huge chunks of agricultural land has been destroyed and hundreds of homes have been swept away. In flood hit regions nationwide, military and rescue agencies are struggling to reach those who've been stranded, with millions of residents at risk of developing waterborne diseases. And for this region already dealing with decades of drought, the monsoon rains should have been a welcome reprieve, not the cause of such destruction. As the world continues to spin out of control, we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Almighty God, the creator of heaven, earth, and all things is trying to get our attention. He is letting us know through powerful weather catastrophes and the events happening in the world around us that he is in control. And he is preparing to intervene in world affairs climaxing in the return of Jesus Christ. The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. 
believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. See, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself. As we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. through Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14:17. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, 
because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!